Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. Our session is going to discuss the book of Nahum, one of the minor prophets. And it starts out in the first chapter saying the burden or the oracle against Nineveh. The book of the vision of Nahum the Elkoshite. God's wrath on his enemies is the title of, the, of this section. And in the New King James Version it reads like this. God is jealous and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges, avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. The clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry, and dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither, and the flower of Lebanon wilts. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you, you would read that and you wouldn't think very friendly. No. But maybe there's a reason because there's a, there's a little paragraph in Christ Object Lessons mm -hmm. that goes along with this and it's, it's a commentary on verse 3 which is the Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not acquit the wicked. Mm -hmm. It goes like this. The world has become bold in transgression of God's law. Because of his long forbearance, men have trampled upon his authority. They have strengthened one another in opposition and cruelty towards his heritage, saying, How doth God know? And is there any knowledge in the Most High? But there is a line beyond which they cannot pass. The time is near when they will have reached the prescribed limit. The Lord will interpose to vindicate his own honor, to deliver his people, and to repress the swellings of unrighteousness. Sounds like wow. there's kind of a reason for God to, to have these kinds of emotion, if we can say that. Yes. Well, it turns out that these words are addressed to Nineveh. Have we run across some other books that previously talked about somebody dealing with Nineveh? Jonah. Jonah. Jonah was about 150 years before Nahum. And now these people have gotten worse and worse. Closer to Nahum's time, they have gotten some powerful generals that have been the, the kings of, of, of Nineveh or Assyria, it was called, was the, nation, the name of the nation. And they have really, really bullied around. They believed they were going to rule the world. They were going to conquer everybody in sight. And they did conquer the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, and they overran the southern kingdom of Israel. And you remember the southern kingdom of Judah. And what happened? It's when the 185,000 Assyrians were killed by the angel as they surrounded Jerusalem. Yeah. Well, Nahum happened a little while before that. So the 185,000 Assyrians haven't been destroyed yet. And in Nahum's day, the Assyrians, it looked like they were going to they were just they were going to run over everybody. And I have a question. Yeah. Are you saying Nineveh is Assyrians are in the city of Nineveh? Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. Assyria. Okay. Now, it's a little difficult in those ancient times because there the country to the south was called Syria and the country to the north called Assyria. So you need to make sure you keep those separate. And Assyria conquered both sides of Jerusalem? Yes, it, Jerusalem. finally when it got down to the end, uh, yes. Mm. Until God intervened, yes. Um, I would like to read this little introduction to 
the book of Nahum from the Message Bible. The stage of history is large. Larger than life figures appear on this stage from time to time, swaggering about, brandishing weapons and money, terrorizing and bullying. These figures are not as they suppose themselves to be at the center of the stage, not in fact anywhere near the center. But they make a lot of noise and are ab able to call attention to themselves. They often manage to get a significant number of people watching and even admiring. Big nations, huge armies, important people. And in that context, you need to understand that uh, Assyria was the first nation we know of in ancient times that actually had a paid army. Before that, it was always, we need to go to war. Can you help? Can you help? You know, please, please come out. Let's, yeah. go, let's go attack our enemies. <clears throat> but uh, Assyrians were big enough and powerful enough and, and, and extracted enough taxes from other nations around them that they actually supported a, a, a professional army. So you can see how they were way ahead of everybody else. At any given moment, a few superpower nations and their rulers dominate the daily news. Every century, a few of these names are left carved on its park benches, <clears throat> marking rather futile and, in, in retrospect, pitiable attempts at immortality. The danger is that the noise of these pretenders to power will distract us from what is going on quietly at the center of the stage in the person and action of God. God's characteristic way of working is in quietness and through prayer. I speak, says poet George Meredith, of the unremarked forces that split the heart and make the pavement toss, forces concealed in quiet people and plants. If we are conditioned to respond to noise and size, we will miss God's word and action. From time to time, God assigns someone to pay attention to one or another of these persons or nations or movements just long enough to get the rest of us to quit paying so much attention to them and get back to the main action, God. Nahum drew that assignment in the 7th century BC. Nahum's time was around about 640 BC, if, if we want to put a date on it. Assyria had the whole world terrorized. At the time that Nahum delivered his prophecy, Assyria dominated uh, and, and its capital, Nineveh, appeared invincible. A world free of Assyrian domination was unimaginable. Nahum's task was to make it imaginable, to free, people, to free God's people from Assyrian paralysis, free them to believe in and pray to a sovereign God. Nahum was preaching his spirit-born metaphors, his God-shaped syntax, knocked Assyria off her high horse, and cleared the field of Nineveh distraction so that Assyria could, I'm sorry, so that Israel could see that, despite her world reputation, Assyria didn't amount to much. Israel could now attend to what was really going on. Because Nahum was a, has a single message, doomed to Nineveh, Assyria, it is easy to misunderstand the prophet as simply a Nineveh hater. But Nahum writes and preaches out of the large context in which Israel's sins are denounced as vigorously as those of any of her enemies. The effect of Nahum is not to foment religious hate against the enemy, but to say, don't admire or be intimidated by this enemy. They are going to be judged by the very same standards applied to us. Now, there's a couple of bits of interesting historical background. There are two places that have been suggested as possible home of Nahum. Uh, one of those places is about 50 miles north of Nineveh. Now, if that's the case, if that's where, Nineveh, that's where Nahum lived and prophesied, that would suggest that he was up there already in captivity with his family and was prophesying from Nineveh's territory. The other interesting possibility is that he lived just east, well, on the eastern border of the Sea of Galilee at a, 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 a small town that was called Kafar Nahum. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Capernaum. Capernaum, exactly. The hometown of Jesus, its actual Aramaic name was the town or the city of Nahum. So we don't know whether that's the same Nahum or whether it was some other Nahum, but that's a possibility. Interesting little historical detail. The other historical detail, I've already talked a little bit about the Assyrian army. The god Asher, 
Well, you can see how they got Assyria from Asher. The god Asher was a god of war. And it was, it was thought, if you, if you joined the army and you went out to fight on behalf of Asher, Asher would reward you in every possible way. And we know that some people who come from that part of the world still have that idea that if you, if you die in battle fighting for your god, you will be immortalized, no doubt. I have a question. Yeah. How, where did Nahum come from? Does a, I mean, he's a Jew, right? Mm -hmm. And did he just start talking one day? Does it give a background about his credentials as a prophet? Well, well how do they, how do they um, get their message out? Do they just go around to towns and towns and just preach on the corner? Or do they go to the temple? Or what do they do? Oh, that's a good question. Or did he write it? Well, obviously yeah, he wrote it down at some point. Yeah, originally. And so the question would be, if he lived in already in, in, in Ninevite territory, Assyrian territory, he would have to presumably write it down and, and manage to send it back to Israel because the message was primarily for them. You don't send a message like this to, directly to Nineveh. Uh, now, we have to admit that uh, some 150 years earlier, Jonah had gone there and he'd, got, he'd gotten the, the Ninevites to repent with language that was very close to this. Yeah, which language was very close to this. Well, um, what, what can we draw from this? Because God took their um, apologies or whatever it takes, you know, to be forgiven. Mm -hmm. And he did not wipe them out like, like uh, Jonah said he, they were going to. Yeah. So um, now a few hundred, a hundred years later, they just turn back and they start doing the same thing again. Mm -hmm. So do we look at them as a people or is it just like another generation and their children didn't listen? Yeah. Fortunately, and none of us are like that, that we, uh, <laughs> you know, we, yeah, but do, it kinda, we do exactly what we said we would 150 years ago. It kind of it kind of looks like you know when you're reading the Bible that you're talking to the same people, but yeah. it's actually another generation. A couple, of two, three which, generations later. Yeah, and they could be completely different than the one, than their forefathers. And the trouble is, is, it doesn't usually work that way. History tends to repeat itself. Yes. People tend to do well, that's the same thing. That's actually what is saying. It, well, three generations later, you do the same thing over again. Well, but that's the point. So you expect God to come back and, and be going to treat them exactly the same way you would have treated them if they hadn't repented. Yeah. And then, then you wonder about his plan to make, make sure that nobody lives over 78 years old, you know, or 71 or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And um, so you're going to have new people have to learn all over again. And, you know, they, they can't get anything from people from experience who repented before, you know, they're all gone, they're on the grave, and then the stuff seems to go like a cycle and cycle and cycle. He, he's the one that came up with the fact that, the, that people were only going to live so long, mm -hmm. and yet the, the earth is going to go for so long, who's, more, who's, more than that. Who's he? Who came up with this 70 years? Well, God. He, they're not going to... Um, what, what's the thing in the Bible where it three says that three score years and ten? Yeah, seven years. Yeah, that was David's comment. That was his comment, but you know, it's, he's just making an observation there, and yeah. that's it, definitely that's what God had arranged from then on. What, what what do you suppose God has in mind when He comes out with that kind of language you read there? I mean, it sounds like God is really mad. He's full of anger. He's wrathful. It gets the people's attention, first of all. Gets people's attention? I think he's tolerant, but there's an end to it. Well, if you were one of the 185,000 soldiers, hmm. <laughs> maybe you'd think this was kind of factual language. Yeah. Yeah, factual. Yeah. Okay. And, th and if it is, if he is that way, then it's really pretty nice of him to warn people that, he is, that, that that is kind of coming. Yeah. Do we have any uh, clues so far in Scripture that would t let us know anything about God's wrath? Romans 1. We haven't got to Romans 1 yet. There's description in Romans 1. But we've gone the through flood? the whole Bible. We're, we're putting yeah. it all together now. Okay. This, this sounds like Revelation. Yes, it sounds like Revelation 14, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, Noah's flood. 
in Noah, but the, one of the clearest places is actually Judges 2 and 3. And they would follow God for a little while, and He would bless them, and then they'd turn away to idols, right. and God says, okay, if you leave me, I'll leave you, and bang. It says He gets angry, He lets them go, and they go back into some kind of subservience to some other nation, and they, oh no, God isn't helping us. They rush back to God, and He says, oh, okay. So He starts helping them again, so up they go, and down they go, and up they go. And Read ju ju uh, Judges 2 and 3, it's incredible. And, and, you know, we don't want to spend a long time in that, but basically God's wrath is nothing more than His letting people go and handing them over in loving disappointment, those who are bent on leaving Him anyway, thus allowing them to reap the inevitable and awful consequences of their own behavior. So, what's happening here? Um, is this the the results of a monotheism on the part of Nahum in which everything that happens, like we say everything that happens has to pass God's at least passive will. And so is he describing God's passive will here as the natural results of, of uh, abandoning him take place? Sounds like it, doesn't it? Yeah. There's some interesting questions that arise out of this. One, just in, in passing, look at Nahum 2.4. Chariots dash wildly through the streets, rushing back and forth in the city squares. They flash like torches and dart about like lightning. Is this uh, Nahum having seen a vision of um, the L.A. freeway at some point in time? <laughs> well, they don't have to be impressed very easily for speed, <laughs> I think. Yeah. <laughs> Back then. Back then? Yeah. Or are they tanks? People as have suggested that as well, that maybe it's tanks and warfare, maybe it's cars on a freeway. I, I think this is just an example that Nam is picking up an idea of, of uh, some of the ways in which battles were fought in ancient times and so forth. I don't think we need to make anything big out of it. Another question is this. God seems sometimes to work with the nations. We're going to find out that there are three books in the Old Testament, three minor prophets, all addressed to Nineveh. We've looked at Jonah, we're now looking at Nahum, and we're going to come up to Zephaniah a little bit later. And these, and they're, they're in order. Jonah came first, and then about 150 years later was, was um, this one, uh, Nahum. And then about... Um, Thirty years after that, finally, at, at Nineveh's demise, basically, uh, we have we have Zephaniah. So, um, what's God doing here with all these nations? I mean, there's there's no Assyria now; it's gone, it's disappeared. Why does why why did God bother to get send them three books of the Old Testament? Wasn't wasn't that basically a waste? I mean, didn't God know what was coming? Well, Judah and Israel weren't doing their job in trying to win them over. Yeah. So God had to go in there on his own and uh, to, I to make contact with him. <laughs> okay. it, it's an object lesson. Uh, <clears throat> God knows that things cycle. Uh -huh. And so he lets it cycle and, and lets it be, be written down so that when we see what happens, we should be able to transfer that to our time. And God doesn't change. We better make sure we do. Okay. Um, are you saying that <clears throat> because the Jewish people did not witness to Nineveh that God got more active with Nineveh and this is God working with non-Jewish people saying uh, realize that there is a God and I am him and I am the God of the Jews yes well I, I think Nineveh was publicly forgiven mm -hmm. a lot of people knew about that 150 years and ago. if he hadn't have done anything to tell them that they're erring again and just came back and smeared them, mm -hmm. you know, what would have been the value of being forgiven? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's got to be some sort of dealing with that somehow and mm -hmm. not just forget about it. A contest. In, 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 oh, go ahead. in those cycles that, that he was talking about in Judges, uh, apply your principle to that. What do you mean? Well, 
uh, you were saying that God wouldn't, well, that there had like to be some like message. The that, uh, they came out and they asked, he asked Moses, should I just wipe them all out? Yeah. You know, and, and Moses said, no, no, your reputation will go bad if you do that. Yeah. And I think there's a little bit of that in this, since, since Nineveh was publicly forgiven, and now they went off to the deep end again, and God had to make sure that, that look at, they're going off the deep end again. You know, I can't let this keep happening, even though I forgot, gave them in the past. So he sends a message to Judah, and not to Nineveh. Well... Well, that's a question. We don't know where the message was sent. And, and here's, the, here's a principle that we've talked about before, but let's, this is another time. It's, it's illustrated well in, the, in this little book. In the Bible, God seems to go back and forth. He's walking a kind of tightrope. Mm -hmm. One moment he shouts and he carries on like we see here in Nahum, and everybody says, oh, we better do something quick, you know, line up, do mm -hmm. something. And they're all scared to death, and they line up, and they, oh, yeah, okay, God, whatever you say. And then God says, okay, well, now I can back off a little bit. Uh, I want you to know that I'm really not trying to scare you. I really love you and so forth, and I want you to do what's right. Oh, okay, Whew. I guess we can relax. Now we can go back to worshiping our <laughs> fertility gods, et cetera, et cetera. It's back and forth and back and forth. I have uh, another question. Well, oh, Jim, Jim had one here. I was going to contrast the, the uh, opening verses of uh, Nahum here with uh, Isaiah 1 18 mm. come now let us reason together yeah. I mean it's a different setting you can't you can't do it with these people you got to get their attention so you got to use some strong language mm -hmm. that <laughs> mm -hmm. it's a different yeah. from way you're looking at it do we have any strong language addressed specifically to us as a church oh many places are. Revelation Laodicea message what about the three angels especially the third angels message don't we claim that's a part of our message to the world sure. If we don't know how to explain Nahum, when God speaks with that kind of language, what are we doing with the third angel's message? Maybe that's why I haven't heard a lecture on that very recently. <laughs> Nobody's preaching on that? That's right. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, here, uh, on, that, on the idea of that what was happening to them, we should apply to us. Uh, chapter 2, verse 10. She is empty, desolate, and waste. The heart melts, the knees shake, much pain is on every side, and all of their faces are drained of color. Mm -hmm. Now, Ellen White's comments to that. Before his presence, all faces are turned into paleness. Upon the rejecters of God's mercy falls the terror of eternal despair. The righteous cry with trembling, who shall be able to stand? The angel's song is hushed. There is a period of awful silence. Then the voice of God is heard saying, my grace is sufficient for you. The faces of the righteous are lighted up and joy fills every heart. And the angels strike a note higher and sing again as they draw still nearer to the earth. Here's a description of the second coming that is put in here as she talked about this, this verse in, in, in Nahum, what was going on there yeah. is the cycle repeats, is, yeah, but it, it, it's coming and we ought to be looking for it. Paying attention, yeah. Well, you know, when people um, are warned of things, really it's so easy to ignore, like um, until a cop gives you a ticket, you don't you just ignore until you see that there is someone out there giving tickets. And so when God says, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, and everything goes along as normal, it's, I think, human nature to think uh, that doesn't apply to me. Well, certainly the Ninevites didn't think that anything was going to happen to them. They had a city that had a wall around it that was like 50 feet thick and maybe 75 feet high or something like that, and man, it looked like I mean, think of in the days when there were no, no engines, no mechanical devices. You're trying to attack a city with swords and, and maybe uh, a few rocks and things. I mean, what would you do? What would you do to a city like that? Starve it. And they, well, but even that's not easy. Yeah. Even Did they have a stream running through it like Babylon? 
Well, there's rivers nearby, and I don't know exactly. They may have had some canals going into the city or whatever, and where they could have blocked them or whatever. But what actually happened is that eventually a couple of nations went against them and caught them off guard, and basically they, they thought they were fine, and they got wiped out. Is this verse 6 in chapter 2? The river gates are open, the palace is yeah. in dismay. Yeah, exactly. Similar to what they did in uh, Babylon, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, in light of some of the, what we just read, I'd like to, of us to turn over to um, Revelation 14 and just in the last couple of minutes we have before the break, look at uh, especially the words starting with verse 9. Revelation 14 starting with nine, verse 9. See if this sounds at all like, like uh, Nahum. A third angel followed the first two, saying in a loud voice, Those who worship the beast in his image and receive the mark on their forehead or on their hand will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, which he has poured out at full strength into the cup of his anger. All who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur before the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of the fire that torments them goes up forever and ever. There is no relief day or night for those who worship the beast in his image, for anyone who has the mark of its name. Does that sound a little bit like what you read there at the beginning, Norm? Pretty similar. <laughs> Pretty, Pretty similar. similar. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, in either one, how could, you, how could the human language be more forceful? Yeah. They, the, 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 whoever the writers are here, I mean, John and Nahum in this case, they're trying to get God's word out and they're trying to help us. And, and I mean, this Revelation 14 is supposed to be for our day. Um, you know, how many people are out there in the street saying, listen, people, do you know what God is trying to say to you? Should they be? Well, what would happen if they were? Suppose uh, you and I went down to, to Los Angeles and stood on the street corner and started preaching this. What would happen? <laughs> we'll probably get hauled off on a paddy wagon. Yeah, 72-hour hold. <coughs> but, but they couldn't do that to a whole population. If all Adventists were telling their neighbors about that, mm -hmm. what would happen? Yeah, well, there's another scenario, very interesting possible scenario. One in which people would make a decision for or against God mm -hmm. and so you're <coughs> saying if you if you're instead of standing on the street corner in Los Angeles if you're knocking on your neighbor's door it's a little different yeah it is at least quantitatively <laughs> <laughs> okay so well in Nahum we have seen uh, a, a very powerful message using very strong language we don't know whether Nahum was already in captivity or he was just predicting going into captivity. Either way, uh, the message is pretty similar. And he uses the strongest language he can find to try to warn people that serious, serious times are coming. Not just serious times for Nineveh, serious times for Israel, serious times for, for Judah. In fact, Ni uh, Israel, the northern kingdom, has already gone into Assyrian captivity. And maybe that's why Nahum himself was up there in the north somewhere. That's possible. But Nahum is a message that God will not keep quiet if he sees his children being destroyed, if he sees us in trouble. He's not just sitting, going to sit back and do nothing. He's going to speak up as he did in Revelation 14. And we need to pay attention. We need to be reading these messages and hearing what God has to say. Don't go away because we're going to move right now to another book.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. We're going to move now down about 30 years to around 610, 612 BC, and we're going to look at the, the small book of Habakkuk, as we say. Other people in other languages pronounce it in different ways. And to just set the historical background, in 612 BC, Nineveh fell to the Medes and the Babylonians. So the city we were talking about just now is collapsed. Three years later, 609 BC, Josiah, the king of, of Judah, died in a futile attempt to try to oppose the Egyptians. The Egyptians were on their, on their way up because they were going to they were going to beat the they were going to beat the Ninevites, they were going to beat the Babylonians, and they head up like this, and, and, and Josiah went out with his pitiable little army and tried to fight them and got himself killed. Four years later, 605 B.C., Babylon swept down from the north, following the Fertile Crescent like that, swept down from the north and defeated e Egypt at Carchemish, and Nebuchadnezzar's reign began as his father, Nebuchadnezzar, died. In that same year, that same year was the first conquest of, of Judah by the Babylonians. Babylon actually conquered Judah three times. It wasn't until the third time that they just completely flattened everything, destroyed Solomon's temple, destroyed Jerusalem, broke down all the walls. But this is the first conquest of, of Judah. And what did they do at that time in terms of captives? Do you remember? They took the royalty and so on like Daniel. They took a very select young men and women who were in, in well-educated, high positions, and they said their, their idea was that these young people would go get a Babylonian education, and they would become ambassadors that would, that would relate from Judah to, to Babylon. They had no idea that it was, Judah was going to continue to be such a rebellious care group. And so that was the idea. So um, uh, who are, what famous names were among those who were taken off in that first captivity? Daniel, Daniel three. Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, what we more commonly known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're Babylonian names. Um, so that was the context. Then in, in about seven years later, in 598 B.C., Judah had rebelled again, and, and Nebuchadnezzar came back, and this time he wiped out basically the whole country except, Ju except Jerusalem and took away most of the population into captivity. And the, the prophet who was connected to that captivity was Ezekiel. Finally, again, 12 years later, they came back the third time, and Nebuchadnezzar was, was really tired of this by this time. And he says, we're going to flatten this place. We're not going to leave anyone here. And that, those were the days of Jeremiah. So... That's the context in which Habakkuk was, uh, was speaking. Now, it turns out that there are about six or seven different prophets, all prophesying at the same time in or around Jerusalem and at the time of Habakkuk. Why do you suppose that was? Why do you suppose there were all of a sudden? I mean, there were long periods of time with no prophets at all. All of a sudden, now we've got seven. Is that because something important was going to happen? That's because the nation of Judah was just about to go into Babylonian captivity, and most of them who went off into Babylonian captivity would never come back. So it was a time of crisis, and God was re trying to reach them from several different angles, yes. and he didn't succeed. And if you look back about 120 years, when the northern kingdom was in trouble, there were four prophets at that time trying to warn people. So we see at times of crisis, what does God do? Turns up the megaphone. Yeah, he turns up the megaphone. He steps out. He says, we want to we wanna let you know that. And what do the people do in response? Well, unfortunately, usually nothing or little or nothing. Some did. Some did. That seems to really be a pattern, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Things go sour. God sends a prophet. They reject the prophet. And then bad. it all goes bad. Mm -hmm. And the cycle starts again. We had a prophet. Mm -hmm. Many reject it now. Mm -hmm. Are we just in the same cycle that we've been reading about here? I don't want to hear it. <laughs> Should we hear it? Well, let's talk a little bit about Habakkuk and what he had to say. 
Living by faith is a bewildering venture. I mean, try to, I mean, we Americans, we, we, we can't really even imagine this. We just assume that if we as Americans get involved in any war, we're either going to win flat out, or at least we're going to go home with a draw. You know, we're not going to lose wars. But imagine if you were a relatively small country and you're being overrun by a very powerful force and, and that force is coming down and intending to just flatten you. What do you do? Find a cave and hide? I mean, what do you do? Well, here's Habakkuk. Living by faith is a bewildering adventure. We rarely know what's coming next, and not many things turn out the way we anticipate. It is natural to assume that since I am God's chosen and beloved, I mean, obviously I am, I don't know about you, but I am, I will get favorable treatment from the God who favors me so extravagantly. It is not unreasonable to expect that from the time that I become his follower, I will be exempt from dead ends, muddy detours, and cruel treatment from the travelers I meet daily who are walking the other direction. That God followers don't get preferential treatment in life always comes as a surprise. How could that be? But it's also a surprise to find that there are a few men and women within the Bible who show up alongside us at such moments. The prophet Habakkuk is one of them, and a most welcome companion he is. Most prophets, most of the time, speak God's words to us. God has something to say. I mean, look, we just looked at Nahum. God has something to say, and sometimes they're very powerful words, and we just sort of ooh, ooh, sit back there and quake. But Habakkuk is very different. Um, see. They are preachers, these prophets, they are preachers calling us to listen to God's words of judgment and salvation, confrontation and comfort. They face us with God as He is, not as we imagine Him to be. Most prophets are in your face, asserted, not given to tact, not diplomatic, as they insist that we pay attention to God. But Habakkuk speaks our, our word to God. He gives voice to our bewilderment articulates our, our puzzled attempts to make sense of things, faces God with our disappointment with God. He insists that God pay attention to us, and he insists with the prophet's characteristic no-nonsense bluntness. The circumstance that aroused Habakkuk took place in the 7th century B.C., late in the 7th century, I might add. The prophet realized that God was going to use the godless military machine of Babylon to bring God's judgment on God's own people, using a godless nation to punish a so-called godly nation. It didn't make sense, and Habakkuk was quick and bold to say so. He dared to voice his feelings that God didn't know his own God business. Not a day has passed since then that one of us hasn't picked up and repeated Habakkuk's bafflement. God, you don't seem to make sense. But this prophet companion who stands at our side does something even more important. He waits and he listens. It is, it is in his waiting and listening, which then turns into his praying, that he found himself inhabiting the large world of God's sovereignty. Only there did he eventually realize that the believing in God life, the stead, steady trusting in God life, is the full life the only real life. Habakkuk started out exactly where we start out with our puzzled complaints and God accusations, but he didn't stay there. He ended up in a world along with, God, uh, along with us where every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. And the reason... And that was from... That's from um, Eugene Peterson's The Message Bible Introduction to Habakkuk. And the reason, and I like to do something I don't usually do, I like to turn over the very last verses of Habakkuk, and we'll see why it is that um, he made those comments. Look at chapter 3, verse 17. I'm going to read from 17 to the end. And try to imagine now that you're living in Judah. You're a subsistence farmer. That means what you and your family have to eat is what you grow as crops, are what your animals produce. That's what you have right there. That's what you live on for the next year, okay, until the next round of crops come. Okay, so here's Habakkuk. I will quietly wait. I'm going to read the last part of verse 16. I will quietly wait for the time to come 
when God will punish those who attack us. Quietly wait. But even though the fig trees have no fruit and no grapes grow on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no grain, even though the sheep all die and the cattle stalls are empty, what do you have left? Not much. Not much. I will still be joyful and glad because the Lord God is my Savior. The Sovereign Lord gives me strength. He makes me sure-footed as a deer and keeps me safe on the mountain. So things are really bad. I mean, the context in Habakkuk's day was really bad. Now, Habakkuk is writing in a different type. It almost looks like poetry or rhymes. It's a dialogue, and much of it in poetry form. And so he is a prophet that puts the people's words into some kind of mm -hmm. form. And what does he do? Read this on the street corner or s offer the prayer in the synagogue? Mm -hmm. Here, let, let's pick up your, your question and, and just take some examples. Look at Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2. Oh Lord, how long must I call for help before you listen, before you save us from violence? Why do you make me see such trouble? How can you stand to look on such wrongdoing? Destruction of violence are all around me, and there is fighting and quarreling everywhere. The law is weak and useless, and justice is never done. Evil people get the better of the righteous, and so justice is perverted. Things sound pretty bad, don't they? Then the Lord said to his people, Keep watching the nations around you, and you will be astonished at what you see. I'm going to do something that will, you will not believe when you hear about it. And what do you suppose it is he's going to do that they wouldn't believe? He's raising up another group of people, the Chaldeans. And who are the Chaldeans? Babylonians. Babylonians. He's going to bring the Babylonians to discipline his own people. Godless, idol-worshiping, pagan people. God is going to bring them and use them to discipline his people Israel. Now how can that possibly make any sense? Well, what, what, what's Habakkuk's response? Look at chapter 2, verse 1. I will climb my watchtower and wait to see what the Lord will tell me to say and what answer he will give me to my complaint. The Lord gave me this answer. Write down clearly on tablets what, are I, what I reveal to you so that it can be read at a glance. Put it in writing because it is not yet time for it to come true. But the time is coming quickly, and what I show you will come true. It may seem slow in coming, but wait for it. It will certainly take place. And it will not be delayed. And this is the message. Those who are evil will not survive, but those who are righteous will live because they are faithful to God. Now, some of you might recognize, especially have one of the more traditional translations. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Now, why do you suppose mine is so much different than that? What uh, chapter and verse are you in? That was Habakkuk 2.4. The... What do you have? Somebody have some really different messages in Habakkuk 2.4? The righteous shall live by his faithfulness, you could say. Yeah. <clears throat> Anybody else? What does the Message Bible have over there, Carrie? Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. Okay. Okay, so everything looks bad. Nothing is going right. Mm -hmm. The <clears throat> crops are lousy. But it's, you said that it was kind of in a lull between armies um, threatening to attack. They're kind of gone right at the moment. Mm -hmm. But now... Um, it's just bad. Everything's bad. And there doesn't seem to be much hope for the future right. and whatever. And now, this is when you live by faith. You hope is, that there's going to be enough food for tomorrow and the next day and the day after that. And you, you don't know whether the next day after that the Egyptians are going to come from the south or whether the Babylonians or the, the Ninevites are going to come from the north. It's just a bad situation. Then it's time for though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And that is the best example, I mean, a good example of what we, what famous biblical principle? The faith, right? Shall Trust. Live by faith. Yeah, exactly. So, so faith doesn't really come about because people, things are going good for you no. all the time. That doesn't, that doesn't buoy your faith right there. Faith 
just stays there, whether it's good or bad, and this is really bad here, you're going to continue to live by faith. Think about the time that we've been told about in Revelation, just before Christ comes. Mm. And as we have read it in, in, in Ellen White's writings, the faithful, the just, are in little bands in various parts of the hinterland. Uh, the, the world has given the day and the hour when, when they can be killed at, ransom, at, at random because they've got to go. And it looks like they are all going to go and Satan is going to win 100%. Yep. And at that point, they are saying, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And it takes God to come in and change, the, change it out and well, it all happens. Well, not only that, but it seems like the punishment, like back it says, doesn't make sense either because you're going to have the heathen come down and and punish us. Yeah. So even their concept of God is turned upside down here. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the, this is the right time for us to ask about the great controversy. Mm. Who out there might be watching all this take place? The whole universe. The, A whole universe. Angels. angels and beings from other worlds. And they're looking down and they're w watching what we're talking about right here. What do you think they, they think is happening? Think, God, man, you're doing just so well. Everything's coming out just great. I mean, look what your people are doing. Well, he's saying, looking at... God, it's time for another flood. Time for another flood. No, do something big. I don't think it's that as much as that they're looking at those people and, and they're understanding that they can't see what's ahead of them or behind them. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just something that can happen. And it can even happen to them up there, you know, which it did one time. Mm -hmm. You know, with the war and all that. But, um, but you know. Here's, here's the question. They have just seen God tell Babylon, this pagan nation with its fancy army, okay, it's all right to go. Now, Babylon didn't realize they were being told by God. They just set off, and, but God gave them permission. Otherwise, they couldn't have done it. And they're going to overrun Judah and take, basically wipe that nation out. And the people, the beings in the rest of the universe are saying, Hold on a minute, God. What in the world is going on here? I thought your people were supposed to be... Re now, we admit that you, they weren't doing a real good job of representing you, but you're going to wipe them out now? But, but even, even better of those are going through the same thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not just, just the ones that are kind of mediocre, but even the better ones are yep. going through the same thing. They're and they're putting themselves... If you look down, they could probably put themselves in their place and wonder what in the world would they think if they were in that place. Yeah, that's exactly the question I'm asking you. Did they, that, did they think that God was going to destroy all his people and everything would have been for naught? That well, here you have this big, powerful army descending upon helpless little Judah. What do you think is going to happen? God, you've got to do something to save your reputation. Yeah. They're going to think that you're powerless. And how, what is God going to do? But the thing is, they're going to send the Babylonians. What kind of saving is that? <laughs> well, that's, the, that's the question. <laughs> While that's going on, God will f quietly be building faith inside some of those people that are being tested. Well, that's all they got is faith. He well, said, I mean, what have they got? <laughs> keep reading. Yeah, keep reading. <laughs> keep reading. <laughs> Hang yeah. with it. Well, and, and what happens? Let's, let's think about what happened here in this country right after 9-11. We pulled together. Not only that, what? And, and Everybody became an impromptu theologian. Why is God doing this? Why did God allow this? Da, 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 da. Why all did, the churches but, filled up, too. And all the churches months. filled about up. About a week. Yeah. Well, it was a couple months, but it was it short didn't last long. <laughs> didn't last long. So what does that tell us? People can be scared into church? For a short time. For a little while. For a little while. So, and those that aren't have to live by faith. Those that stay in the church yeah. during tough times when Babylon comes down and they get hauled off, they still have to live by faith. Yeah. There were some who were taken into Babylon who didn't give up their faith. It was tough on them, yes, but it's they didn't give yeah. up. Yeah. 
It's interesting that this phrase, the just shall live by faith, which is the or old King James Version, which isn't a very good translation, I might add, is picked up, especially by Paul, quoted in Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, and Hebrews 10.38. And each place has a little different context. Why, why do you suppose Paul grabbed onto this verse? He could apply it in his own life. Yeah, you, know, you, you list what happened to him, and he was probably the one who did just exactly this. About the time he got knocked down on the Damascus Road, he said, what do I have left, right? Right, exactly. I, I lost my position with the Sanhedrin. I lost my Jewish background. I lost my family. I lost everything. What am I going to do now, Lord? Then he was beaten and left for dead and in prison and shipwrecked, and he was still mm -hmm. living by faith. It's interesting that the way this phrase, the, the just, which really means the righteous, shall live by faith, is constructed in Greek in such a way so that you can't tell whether the live goes with righteous or whether the live goes with faith. So the question is, is it those who live righteous lives will have faith, or should it mean those who are righteous will live by their faith? Or did Paul pull one of his sneakies like he did in several other occasions occasions and intended for it to be both. Doesn't he say right in that same verse, Romans 1 17, from faith to faith, right? Mm -hmm. So I think probably he was, now let, let me read once again what, the, what Habakkuk's context is and then I'm going to talk about what this, how this verse has been used down through the centuries. I'm what? reading Habakkuk 2 4, yeah? Okay, 2 4. And this is the message. Remember what the context was in Habakkuk days. Those who are evil will not survive, but those who are righteous will live because they are faithful to God. Okay? Those who are righteous will live because, so they live by their faith, right? Because they are faithful to God. Are we splitting hairs there? Can, can you have one without the other? Can you have real faith without a righteous life? Or could you have a righteous life without the faith? I don't think you can split them. Okay. I think Paul intended for them to be together. And he, he worded it in Greek in such a way that you can't tell which it's supposed to be, so it probably is supposed to be both. Mm. Yeah. Well, who else, what other famous person down through history made a big deal out of this verse? Do you remember? Martin, Martin Luther. Luther. Martin Luther. There's a story, and I don't know if this can be, can be proven or not, but there's a story that's been passed down to the, say, to the years that there's a famous staircase. You can still see it in Rome if you go there. Uh, St. John's Lateran Church out on the edge of Rome. There, it is believed that the staircase on which Jesus stood when, when Pilate was at the top and the Sanhedrin were calling for his death at the bottom, uh, that Jesus was somewhere about halfway up more or less on the staircase, and that staircase was miraculously transported by angels from Jerusalem to Rome and set down by this church in, in Rome. And there's a rumor, there's a theory, I've never seen, I've been, on, been to the place, but there, there supposedly is a place about halfway up where there's a drop of Jesus' blood is actually sunk into the granite or into the marble or whatever it is there, and it's actually still supposed to be visible there. And if you climb those stairs on your knees with a prayer and a, everything, a, a rosary and a, a mass, I guess, at every, at every step, you will come out with many, many, many years of, of um, relief from, from purgatory. Well, the story is that Martin Luther was climbing those stairs on his knees, and he got about halfway up, and he remembered this verse, and he says, the just are not going to live by climbing stairs on their knees and praying, you know, to Mary and a rosary, they're going to live by their faith. And he, got, he stood up and turned around and walked down, and that some people would call that the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. Hmm. So this verse has a long history. Um, something else. Does this justification or justified here, um, and just, it's, it's interesting, let's just look at that for a moment. If you come to the word dikos, D-I-K-O-S in Greek, it means right. If you come to adikos, which is the negative in, in Greek, in front of, it means unrighteous, okay? If you come to 
dikaiosune, the long noun, that means righteousness. But when we come to the verb, dikaiao, we say, oh, that means to be justified. It doesn't make any sense. It really ought to be rightify, to be rightified. We ought to use right all the way through this, but we don't have an English word rightify. So what are we going to do? And so we have this, these big, long theological discussions and arguments about what this word is supposed to mean. So in this context, it means people who have a right relationship with God will continue to live and grow based on that right relationship. I think that's what we need to say. So we don't have a word called rat rightify, and yet I know exactly what you mean when yes, you say it. Exactly. We need to invent that word, right? <laughs> yeah, right, right. To make right. It really means to, to make right, to set right, to put right, something like that. That's what the word should mean. That's what it originally meant. But we don't have the, so, so we end up with justify, and you say, what's justify? I mean, do we use justify? Well, we use it in our printers, don't we? Justify right. the model. We make everything right. <laughs> Well, if you say God is righteous, in other words, you can say God will always do the right thing in all circumstances. Mm -hmm. But you have to perceive that by an act of faith. And it may not feel right. It's not a switch that you turn off and on. It's, it's a growth <laughs> that you get it. Yeah. So, There's, Ken, what have we learned about God in the books of Nahum and Habakkuk? Well, uh, one word, verse I want us to read to try to come to that answer. Look at Habakkuk 2.14. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14. But the earth will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord's glory as the seas are full of water. Now we have only a few seconds left to answer that. Habakkuk, in his faith, is looking forward to the time when everyone living here on planet earth will be honoring and glorifying God's name. And when will that be? After the not third the, coming. Not this side of the second coming, that's right. for sure. <laughs> It'll have to be after the third coming. But, but Habakkuk is saying, there may not be anything to eat in my house. Everything seemed to may be going to hell in a handbasket. But I trust God. I've had my, my conversation with God, and God has assured me. And so I look forward to the time when this earth will be full of honor and glory to God and not full of all this terrible, awful things that are happening now. Mm. See you next week. <laughs>